kind of? What about now? Yeah? Okay. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. We're going to watch a small eight-minute video that's very relevant to today's subject. And after the video, we're going to begin today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, I want to thank you all for your patience, and we'll start the video now. Thank you. Those violent protests. Before we start, in honor of Remembrance Day, could we please all stand uh, for a moment of silence, please? I'm so glad you all agree with that. <laughs> okay, now, um, just as I was looking over people from various places coming here, so how many of our, our, our American friends are here? <laughs> Wonderful, welcome, and welcome to great Canadian weather. <laughs> and how many of you are out of province? Clap. That's wonderful. And when I was going over the list, I don't know if I'm being punked, but somebody bought a ticket from Norway and Switzerland. Is that true? And if so, really? Stand up. Very um, dedicated. <laughs> okay. Now, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the organizer and moderator of today's event. My name is Serena Singh. Some of you might know me by my alias, Recovering Social Worker. Why recovering, you ask? Well, that's a bit of a complicated uh, answer. And let me try and explain briefly. Believe it or not, I used to be a feminist. I used to be a social justice warrior. I used to be very left-leaning in my thinking, and I would be the type of person that would have been really pissed off about an event like this today. <laughs> I'm very pleased to say that I came to my senses, and I now consider myself more of a centrist slash leaning liberal thinker. And so you're probably wondering, what happened to cause such a drastic change in me? Well, after spending the last 22 plus years in academia, in psychology, social work, and also in the profession, like I have worked with every community, every group you can imagine, I can say 100% uh, with certainty that for the most part, the social work corrupt, uh, field is corrupt now. Uh, there is a, a constant policing of language and, and thought, and if you, dare to, if you dare to deviate from what is considered the Marxist, feminist, anti-race activist, um, transgender narrative, then you will find yourself quickly demoted, um, fired, or ostracized by your colleagues. I certainly had people ask me um, when I give any defense of, of Western philosophy or literature, I've been told I suffer from internalized colonialism, <laughs> internalized racism, and that because the British subjugated for India for a couple of hundred years, there's some residual effect on me. Um, never mind that my dad, is, I'm a Sikh woman, a woman of color, my dad's the guy in the turban in the front row, not hard to find, he's the only one. <laughs> so never in my life could I imagine that I would be called a Nazi, a fascist, and a white apologist. Um, that's been the strangest thing, I must say, in organizing this. Now, I commented on the corruption in social work, but mind you, there's also very, very dedicated people in the field. As I was preparing for this event, the one thing that really struck me was the number of teachers that are emailing me from high school to elementary school. Their emails sound frantic and desperate, and that deeply, deeply concerns me. They basically are telling me, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this. And second, they feel completely um, alienated within the school board. They are terrified to speak out. They feel they have to teach lessons that even though they don't agree with intellectually and ethically, they feel like they don't have a choice. I think that should concern not just me, but each and every one in, in this room, and definitely those of you who have children in schools. 
And the other group that seems really, really terrified, interestingly enough, was nurses. So I never expected that. That was a bit of a surprise. So as my mentor, Dr. Peterson, always says, the price you pay when you don't speak up is worse than the pr price you pay when you speak up. So speak out I did. And yes, there were very serious consequences from financial to emotional to mental health. But I have no regrets because now I sleep very well and I can write, say, and think whatever I feel without worry of Big Brother watching. <laughs> I really believe that a part of our soul and conscience is eroded when we are silenced. And to see such an amazing turnout, just take a look around, is so uh, encouraging to me. And since the ticket sales have ended, I've received at least two, 300 calls, people guilting me that it's ch their children's birthday today. There's actually a family outside, I've just been told, uh, who just showed up and said, we want tickets for our kids. So um, the demand for today's event was enormous. And this was without us putting this on any radio or any print advertisement. It was just based on word of mouth and what we advertised in our own uh, social media platforms. So. I'm ending soon, don't worry. Descartes Maxim, I think, therefore I am, I feel is now replaced with, I feel therefore I am. A culture of safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, and therapy dolls are now commonplace in university and colleges. Even places like Yale, which is now infamous for that um, whole Halloween costume incident. How many of you know about that? Okay. Yeah, that type of hysteria that's taking place at uh, higher academic institutions of learning. And before we move on to our first speaker, I just want to say that I think most of you know this, but in case some of you don't, this event was scheduled to take place on August 22nd. I had requested uh, a room at Ryerson of 500 chairs, and we were just going to sit in front and just have a conversation about free speech. Then, very last minute, they told me, no, you can't have the 500 chair room uh, because there's a law seminar. I said, okay, well, I'm flexible on time, so whenever the seminar is over, and they said, no, the seminar is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., so you can't have the room. So I said, okay, is there any other room? They said, no. So with the help of Dr. Amate, we got a room of 380 people. So this talk was supposed to have 380 people. And today, thanks to all the protesters and the awareness, we have 1,500 people in here. And why did Ryerson cancel? Uh, because there's a radical fringe group called No Fascists. They threaten chaos, disruptions, and protests at our event. They have been putting swastikas and calling us fascists and Nazis, which I must say as a woman of color, that is the strangest thing to me to be called a Nazi, because if I was alive in Nazism in that period, I'm sure it wouldn't go too well. Um, so the university canceled two minutes before the event and people were emailing me saying they had booked hotels, flights, car reservations, and I felt awful, but I'm so glad that we could reorganize and I'm so glad that Dr. Peterson, Dr. Sad, and Dr. Amate have encouraged me all along and been very supportive because, you know what, as a private citizen, for me to be able to reach out and get such uh, reputable academics and scholars to take out their time and come here really, really means a lot, and I'm, I'm very thankful. I want to end by saying, without freedom of speech, our civilization <coughs> descends into fascism and totalitarianism. We need not look any further than Turkey, um, North Korea, some of, many of the Arab countries. Today is Remembrance Day, and millions have perished for this freedom, and I worry that so many people are taking these freedoms for granted. And I am, and I believe our panelists as well, are of the Milton Mills School of Thought, which is that all ideas, no matter how offensive and insulting, should be spoken about in the public forum because it is only when ideas are spoken in the public forum that bad ideas will be countered by good ideas and their bad positions will become self-evident. The answer is not to bury those ideas because they go underground, they brew, and they fester, 
and then we have chaos. Okay, thank you, and I'm gonna now introduce our first speaker.